This podcast is recorded on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam peoples. British Columbia, I've seen your mountains high, seen your pretty rainbows and your blue crystal skies, watched your winding rivers as they flow around the bend. To me, you're not a stranger, you'll always be a friend. Coming to you from the West Coast, this is Politicos. Today is September 30th, 2021, and this is episode 259. I'm Scott Lennerboom. And I'm Ian Bushfield. Today is National Truth and Reconciliation Day. It's probably not when you're listening to this, the way we record and release the next day, but you pro- hopefully saw lots of great resources that you could access when it was September 30th. I'll just flag the University of Alberta's Indigenous Canada course, which is a free online course that you can take if you want to learn more uh, about our history and our present that I think is very valuable. On today's show, we have Micah Goldberg, our legal analyst, back for the first time in quite a while. He's going to help us break down what happened in the agreement that Meng Wanzhou reached that unofficially helped bring the two Michaels back home. And then we'll look at the Ferry Creek decision to not extend the injunction there. And then after that, Scott and I are going to talk about the BC Liberal leadership debate that happened this week. You probably missed it. First, thanks to everyone who contributes to the show each month or annually. You help make this podcast possible. Go and join them at patreon.com slash politicoast. Politicoast is in partnership with BC Today, British Columbia's daily newsletter dedicated exclusively to BC politics. Sign up for a free trial to have unique coverage of the BC legislature delivered to your inbox every morning. Listeners to Politicoast, enter the offer code CITIZEN for access to a special rate. For your free two-week trial of the newsletter, go to politicstoday.news slash free dash trial. Before all of that other great content, we have to do a quick roundup of the greatest BC Premier bracket. Last week, we saw John Duncan McLean versus Duff Patello. Patello ran away with it 13 to 3. It was a three di- I, I, We have three diehard fans is basically what I take from that. Yeah. And I'll be honest, this week's contest is a similar one. We have a bunch of random premiers that are like, they served for a few months or a year and didn't manage to accomplish anything. Sometimes you just need to get through these early ones to get to the later good rounds. So this week we are going to do the first and the final social credit premiers. First up, WAC Bennett. There's so much we could talk about. William Andrew Cecil Bennett, he was the 25th Premier of BC from August 1st, 1952 to September 15th, 1972. A 20-year reign and he wanted to go longer, but the NDP defeated him and interrupted that rule. He was nicknamed Wacky. He ran for social credit, but he thankfully took BC away from the conspiratorial Yeah, at some point we really should do uh, get someone on the podcast who actually understands what the hell the social credit that people were talking about. I, a couple years back, tried to read the Wikipedia page on social credit and honestly just left confused that I could not explain their weird money theories or anything yeah it's half anti-semitism and half like the gold standard slash basic income are necessary but it's there's very- also like this weird like social surplus that gets paid out by the government it it's, it's crank odd. economics it's crank economics it doesn't work it's weird anyway what basically helped W.A.C. Bennett get to power is, we mentioned it before, it was the alternate vote system brought in 1952 by the Liberal Conservative Coalition to keep the CCF out. Instead, the new formed social credit won 19 seats, CCF took 18, but neither had a majority in the 48-seat legislature. The SoCreds got support from independent Labour MLA Tom Uphill, who went with SoCreds over the CCF, much to the CCF's bitterness. They really hoped he'd come with them and help him help make the first CCF government in BC history. And the province would have been much different had that happened. Instead, the Socreds, who when they won in 52, didn't have a leader. They were instead led by Ernest George Hansel, an Albertan MP, who basically parachuted the party into the province because the Socreds had taken over Alberta under Ernest Manning, I think, at the time. Bennett 
became the party leader in the first leadership race in July of 52, and then managed to engineer a defeat for the party in 53 so he could go on to win a majority government. And as soon as he did, he got rid of the alternate vote and put us on first past the post so he could keep winning elections until 1972, seven in total. During that time, BC transformed. They built massive highways everywhere under Gaglardi's ministry. They created BC ferries, BC hydro, BC rail. They built hydro dams everywhere. They established the Bank of BC. They signed the Columbia River Treaty. We're honestly probably going to be coming back to WAC Bennett, so we can get into all of that later. Maybe he'll go down in this round, but I can't, he's probably one of the ones unlikely. I think might be a finalist. Not to you know, share my biases in this. Not that I even necessarily like him, but just his legacy is deep. We're putting him up against Rita Johnston, the final social credit premier, who was the 28th premier of BC from April 2nd, 1991 to November 5th, 1991. Seven months. She does get credit for being the first woman to become premier in, a premier in Canada, even if it was only for seven months, like Kim Campbell, Glass Cliff situation. She was deputy premier under the previous social credit leader, Bill Vanderzam, who when he resigned, she was named interim leader and she won the leadership race over expected front runner Grace McCarthy. So Johnston becomes leader. She inherits a divided party and one riddled with decades of scandals, especially exacerbated by Bill Vanderzam's, um, I don't know, chaos when he was premier. And I can't wait to get to him. She had to go to a general election in 91 just to face, just to deal with the fact that they were out of time and the social credit popular vote was cut in half and her caucus was cut down to seven and Johnston lost her own seat. So unfortunately, she didn't do anything fun, try to give Vancouver Island away during her time as premier, however brief it was. You can go to politicos.ca slash bracket or find pinned to our Twitter the poll for whether you think Wacky Bennett or Rita Johnston was the better premier. Maybe you really hate Wacky Bennett and just want him to go down. Maybe that's your reason for voting Johnston. Let's jump into our first and main segment, One Mang for Two Michaels. We've brought back Micah Goldberg, legal analyst for Politicoast. Micah, it's been far too long. It's a pleasure to be back, gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just so sad we can't do this in person. I'm out in Coquitlam now, so it's just a pain for me to go anywhere. And it's still There's a noticeable it. absence of beer from this recording as compared to the other ones that we've been doing, but that's okay. Yeah, some, sometimes I have a beer cracked, but it's just been the kind of week where, I don't know, I guess I want my wits about me. This is a complicated issue that we're going to talk about Meng Wanzhou's deal and... I guess we don't really have much in the way of the Chinese legal system and how the Michaels got to conveniently walk at the exact same time. But let's maybe start with Meng Wanzhou. And you've done some reading for this. So where do you want to start? Do you want to start with what she signed this week? Or do you want to do well, a bit of background? Yeah, let's do a little bit of background just to get everybody up to speed. So Wang, she is the daughter of Huawei's founder. She's a member of China's political elite. She's the the CFO of Huawei. Her husband owns legal title to two mansions in Vancouver. She is very much an aristocrat in Chinese society. And the the legal issue here surrounds this PowerPoint presentation that she used during a meeting with HSBC in 2013. And specifically the relationship between this one company, Skycom, and her company, Huawei. Huawei has publicly taken the position that Skycom and Huawei are two completely separate entities, that they're just partners. The reason why this is important is because Skycom does business in Iran. Huawei does not. But during this PowerPoint presentation, when she talked about Skycom being a partner, it created the foundation of the legal proceedings that started in the States. The reason why this is so important is because the United States has uh, sanctions against doing business in Iran. And when Wang, excuse me, when Meng was involved in this presentation, she was she was acting like funds that were going to be used by Huawei might not be used by Skycom. In fact, if the funds that were going to be released by HSBC were used by Skycom, 
that would be a contravention of these sanctions. The fact that she misled the banks in this way was the foundation for the fraud claims that the Americans brought up much later in 2018. It was the basis upon which the Americans asked the Canadians to arrest uh, Meng. That was the uh, impetus for this entire extradition process, this PowerPoint presentation in 2013. Yeah, I remember when the detention first happened, uh, there was reporting around that this was about violating the Iranian sanctions, but it's actually lying to HSBC about whether or not they may be violating the sanctions that got her in trouble. Precisely, right? Scott. It's funny that it, this all stems from this PowerPoint presentation, but really, you've nailed it. It's the lying, it's the misleading HSBC about the nature of the relationship between Skycom and Huawei. It should be stated, by the way, and we'll get into this later, that actually, Skycom is a subsidiary of Huawei. The relationship between the two companies is not just a partnership. All right. So, she does this presentation. There's a bounty out for her head an arrest warrant, let's be more honest and accurate, from America. She flies through Canada, border guards grab her and put her into detention. Take us through that bit of the legal bit. Like, she's arrested in Canada. Why, why would we even arrest her? She hasn't committed a Canadian crime. Very simply, there's a, an agreement, a relationship between the United States and Canada on extradition. If somebody commits a crime in the in Canada and escapes to the United States, the Canadian uh, Department of Justice has this ability to request the extradition of the accused back to Canada and vice versa. We also have the Extradition Act in Canada, which governs how that process works. Now, the first thing that needs to happen is that the Americans, uh, in this case, the Americans need to make a formal request that Meng be or the accused be arrested. And that is what uh, started this process. I guess the Americans found out that Meng was going to fly through Canada and requested that the Canadians arrest her. And this was, at least at the very beginning, on a temporary measure, but it was formalized after Christmas. This arrest happened at the, the end of 2018 and into 2019 is when the formal judicial process started. The Americans formally asked Canada not just to arrest uh, Meng, but actually to extradite her to Canada. And uh, the Canadians, after receiving that request, formally decided to commence the extradition proceedings. And when was she actually arrested? I believe it was at the end of 2018, sometime around November. Okay. So then we have her under house arrest. Or was she ever in an actual jail, do you know? After she was arrested, there was this bail that was requested, $10 million. And there were other conditions of bail. Any change, that, as it were. <laughs> exactly. When you own two mansions in Vancouver. She was also required to wear this famous bracelet, the L electronic surveillance piece. She was on house arrest and she had to hand over seven passports. Do you know anybody with that many passports, Ian? I have two, but no. That's quite That's a That's double passports. what I have. But to be fair That's to her, four... Movie. Four, four of them are from China and three of them are from Hong Kong. Apparently, there's different passports that you need for uh, diplomatic reasons, but I don't understand any of that. In any event, um, I'm just going to add one thing on the political side, which is that her arrest, at least in the news reports that I've read, were found to be extremely political because she is seen by China to be a player that should be treated almost like a diplomat. That should be beyond this type of persecution, and it leads to a whole host of issues we're going to talk about later. This is essentially how the Michaels come into play, but of course, that's all extra legal. It has nothing to do with the Extradition Act or the legal process. Yeah, and notably, like there are diplomatic passports that are a thing that she did not have one when she was traveling, probably. I think that she may have, Scott, actually, because there were so many passports that she had. I think some of them may have been issued for diplomatic reasons, but I don't know that. Okay, so she's arrested. It's next step. So here's my question here, and this might come up as a later question, but one of the things I read and heard, and former senior liberals, sort of Cretchen era liberals, made this argument that Canada should have either A, turned a blind eye to this and been like, oops, we missed her, and 
back channeled from the federal government to the border agents to just don't ask, just let her through. Or B, use a provision within the Extradition Act to allow the Attorney General to intervene and wipe this out. Are those actually legal avenues that were available? Obviously, the cloak and dagger stuff, we can't really say for sure. But on this question of what what discretion did the Attorney General have in this? Significant. At the first step, the Department of Justice had the ability to refuse to authorize the extradition hearing to proceed. This is the initial, the very initial step, the first phase in a three-phase process where the Canadians could have said, we've received this request, we're not going to comply with it, we will not extradite Ming, it's over. And then the third phase is the Attorney General's discretion, whether or not to actually extradite this individual, even if it meets the judicial uh, phases satisfaction, even if a judge decides, yes, this person can legally be extradited, the attorney general has this final authority to decide whether or not to extradite them. And is any of that, do you know, in line with our treaty obligations? Like, if we had opted to exercise those options, would we be in violation of our extradition treaty with the states? Obviously, they wouldn't be happy, or at least the Trump administration wouldn't have been happy. Necessarily, it, it, it is something that's allowable. Countries need to um, have some notion of sovereignty, so they could have. And like you asked before, Ian, it would have been it would have been legal. It would have been explicitly within the contemplation of the Extradition Act. But whether or not it's a good idea with respect to our relationships with our largest ally and trading partner and neighbor, that's a, another question, one that isn't necessarily a legal one, but uh, absolutely and heavily. There are a number of uh, legal commentators who saw this as a, a rule of law issue. If you're willing to buckle under the pressure of another country in the face of your strongest um, allies' request to have somebody extradited, it doesn't look very good on how reliable you are as a partner. Yeah, and we also want to be able to recover our criminals when they flee to the U.S. Uh, and blowing up the treaty is not great for us in that respect as well. Well, but it's not necessarily blowing up the treaty. It's just turning a blind eye at one point. Undoubtedly, it would still continue. So let's just continue on with the story. China takes the two Michaels, Spavor and Kovrig into custody for allegations of spying, which they've never provided evidence of, though they did run a trial of some sort that seemed pretty predetermined, and kept them in jail for this entire time. I don't know, Micah, were you wanting to comment on that side of it at all? It's funny, Ian. It, they're very much described by the Chinese media as parallel processes that have nothing to do with each other, even though <laughs> just from a common sense perspective, they're intimately related. And as we see from how matters concluded, they're obviously <laughs> very much related. But while the issue with the Michaels is going on, which is, at least to my mind, extra legal from a Canadian legal lens, the main legal proceedings commence. And to oversimplify, there's really two goals in uh, a Canadian judicial phase extradition extradition proceeding. The first is to determine whether or not this issue of double criminality is made out. Double criminality is really whether or not whatever is alleged to be the crime in the country seeking extradition, the United States, is also a crime in Canada. The second piece is the abusive process. But the judge hearing the trial, Associate Chief Justice Heather Holmes, decides to take the double criminality piece first because it's it's the most straightforward of all of the different processes in the in the Extradition Act. You'll note, by the way, that one of the issues is not whether or not Meng actually committed a crime in this case. That's not what the judicial phase is meant to do. It's confined to these two issues, the abusive process piece and the double criminality piece. What Meng's lawyers say is, look, even if you accept everything that's that Meng is alleged to have done is true, this would not have been a crime in Canada. We don't have these sanctions uh, against Iran, like in the States, they, they have the sanctions. So if Meng misled HSBC about Skycom's relationship with it, and if these funds supposedly intended 
for Huawei were used by Skycom in Iran. In Canada, this wouldn't have been a crime. And at first, um, Justice Holmes says a lot of things in court that support Meng's legal arguments. She says things like a significant of a significant period of time had passed between when these statements were made and when these proceedings were brought. There didn't seem to be any harm that befell HSBC whatsoever. So it was a very strange type of extradition case where it doesn't really seem like there's a victim. And Ian and Scott, you'll remember the famous photos that were being taken on the steps of the British Columbia Supreme Court by Meng and her supporters. So convinced were they by Justice Holmes' comments in court that they were going to be successful. They had this photo op. Do you two remember those pictures being taken? I don't. I vaguely recall there was some minor controversy about whether there were some actors paid to help fill out the protesting ranks, but that's honestly all about it. all I remember about that period from Like I remember some the of the rallies and some of those photos. So there was definitely a media circus in many different directions and it was just I honestly found it exhausting from every side. <laughs> she Meng poses on the steps of the courthouse. At least I thought it was infamous. Maybe no one remembers, but I thought it was pretty incredible. And I have to admit, my hunch was based on what Justice Holmes was saying in court that the extradition process actually wouldn't be allowed to proceed. It just seemed like Justice Holmes was focused very much on the lack of a victim and the, the novelty of this case. And I I was... Not confident, but I thought it, it was more likely than not that she'd be released. And lo and behold, I was incorrect. Most, uh, many legal spectators were incorrect because Chief, Chief Ju- Associate Chief Justice Holmes said, while it's true that we don't have sanctions against Iran in, in Canada, lying to a bank is a crime in Canada. And this is just fraud, what is being alleged in the States. So we have criminal sanctions, criminal penalties against individuals who lie to banks, who commit fraud. So, double criminality was met in her eyes to the absolute shock of... And so, they get her on that. And do they then have to move to the abusive process question, as you were saying? Yeah, they do, Ian. And this was extremely convoluted, multi-pronged. Um, it likely would have taken at least a year to work through these arguments. You had a number of different charter arguments, issues about how Ming was arrested, how evidence was collected, even her the iPhone that she had on her when she was arrested at the Vancouver airport was taken, the passcodes were retrieved, anything and everything that the um, defense team could find to throw at this case, they were going to throw at this case. I think part of that legal I just strategy say for a was... Second there, it's fascinating to see... The, the uber rich, the, the wealthiest of the wealthiest come up against, I don't know that there was any police misconduct, but at least they can test it to the nth degree in a way that like if you or I were arrested by CSIS tom- or board of CBSA tomorrow, like you probably know some of the things to argue, but we don't have the pockets to make the arguments she could, she was able to make. I would have been gone in a week. They would have sent me to the States in a week. I don't think I would have even made it seven days. And uh, Meng made it over a thousand days. Ian, I think you, that's a very good point. Uh, it points to the gap of access to justice between people who are part of the Chinese oligarchy and regular folks. Or the Canadian oligarchy, too. But she was a special case in this situation. I don't even on- know if the Canadian oligarchy is at Meng's level of wealth. So, on the abuse of process, let's say they shouldn't have search through the phone and whatnot would that have really mattered for the extradition like that would seem to me to be a separate question of is anything we gathered admissible was it a a bad thing for those officers to do but if the fundamental extradition request is justified would that have impacted it at all it could but scott luckily for both you and i in this case and justice holmes it never got to that point because before those arguments were thoroughly canvassed, the United States and Miss Mang and Huawei started discussing and negotiating what most spectators thought was some kind of guilty plea. And it wasn't quite a guilty plea, in fact. Instead, they negotiated what looks like an agreed statement of facts 
to form the foundation of a deferred prosecution plan. This is my favorite part of the whole story because it takes me back to the SNC-Lavalin scandal and just how everything involving Trudeau comes back to deferred prosecution agreements. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe not everything, but these two events. And yeah, just we nice was not a deferred prosecution agreement problem. That, that, there were other problems with that one. So for listeners who forget what happened in SNC, we don't need to go through all that. But what's the basics of a deferred prosecution agreement? I'll talk specifically about this type of prosecution, uh, deferred prosecution agreement that was entered into by Meng and uh, the United States. Basically, what would happen is the prosecution of Meng would be deferred for a length of six months. And in the interim, the, the extradition process in Canada would be dropped in exchange for her admission to a number of different facts. One of those facts is that she misled HSBC about the nature of the relationship between Huawei and Skycom. And of course, that is the, like I was saying earlier, the foundation of these charges. But what was, I thought, misreported, I didn't just think it was misreported, it was factually inaccurate, was these reports that Meng was pleading guilty to the charges. She didn't plead guilty. She continued to plead not guilty to the very end. She still says that misleading HSBC in this way was not tantamount to fraud. So even though she's admitted to this, these falsehoods that she uttered during this PowerPoint presentation, that isn't the same as fraud. And I, I just want to Pause there for one second, because I think that this point is important, even from a legal lens. The Americans started this process, asked the Canadians to put their diplomatic necks on the line, basically, to arrest a very high-value Chinese citizen, all in the name of getting her extradited for what were very serious charges of fraud. And it, at the end of the day, after a thousand days of the Canadians going through this process, the Americans more or less dropped all the charges. You have to think that the Americans did not get what they were bargaining for at the beginning and more or less let Meng walk. Here, I think it's super important to recognize there is a different person in the White House now who is probably less eager to just pick random fights and on the geopolitical stage. It was the Trump administration when Meng was arrested. And there was a lot of animosity spewed by Trump at China. And I don't think Biden is pro-China in any way, but I think he represents a return to normalcy in terms of American foreign relations. And just he wouldn't probably have pushed this. Obama probably wouldn't have pushed this in the same way. Like they have smarter ways of going after China. And Canada just got caught in the middle of a Trump-China pissing match here. It's interesting that you say that, Ian, because... At least in theory, and this is another recall from SNC-Lavalin, the Justice Department and the executive are supposed to be at arm's length. Now, after seeing what happened with the SNC-Lavalin case, do you really believe that? What Biden's press secretary was saying after the deferred prosecution agreement was entered into was, that wasn't Biden's call. That's not the um, executive's responsibility to enter into these types of agreements. And this was the Justice Department's decision. Now, do you believe that's true? I can at least accept that Biden might not have personally done it, but he changed who the Attorney General was. And I don't think I was a big fan of the Attorney Generals under Trump. I don't actually know who it is now, but I'll it, tell you it's one kind thing. of permeates I, up and down I, culture. Yeah, you've pointed at the elephant in the room. This change in um, executive, obvious, I shouldn't say obviously, but come on, it's got to have some kind of factor in the decision about what kind of penalty Meng receives. I think, and this is pure speculation, of course, but if Trump was still in the White House, he said publicly that he wouldn't think twice about using Miss Meng's house arrest or incarceration to advance American trade, trade initiatives. If that's the case, you have to think that this deferred prosecution agreement might not be entered into had, had Trump been successful in his re-election efforts. Yeah, when yeah, Trump I, advertised it as a political arrest, effectively, if he got her, he could do political things, then it makes China look a little less bad for arresting people for equally political aims. Like, I'm not trying to both sides this. Canada got 
screwed and that kind of is irrespective of what we do but here we are who got screwed here canada got screwed i think the michaels were really the victims big time in this these are two folks we were i was dancing around what was going on with the michaels because that is extra legal in a lot of ways but the michaels did end up i believe that they admitted to acts of espionage in China. They signed statements admitting that they had committed to acts of espionage. That's the, what I saw China reporting. It, precisely. And I think most most spectators, journalists believe that even if those statements were signed, they were absolutely signed under duress and can't be trusted. So they, in my view, these two Michaels who had their freedom freedoms significantly curtailed over a thousand days, they were losers. Canada was a loser. They were stuck between this superpower fight between China and the United States. I think the the United States looks like a bit of a loser in this as well. They started this process seeking a very high value target, if I can boil things down that way, and then more or less just let her off after a thousand days of very hard work, I thought, by the by the crown in Canada. And then China also looks like a loser in this because they more or less tacitly admitted to playing in hostage politics. I think that Western governments were very unimpressed by the way that they arbitrarily detained two Canadian nationals while Meng was under house arrest living in a mansion, which I don't want to say, by the way, is luxur- luxurious in and of itself. But when compared to the conditions of the Michaels, I'm sure was much more favorable to what they were experiencing. So I think everybody who was involved in this thing has taken a, a bit of a hit. I think that's probably a fairly accurate assessment, although China clearly feels like it can throw its weight around enough. It doesn't need to really hide behind the pretenses or I guess yeah, there's a that, slight that's... pretense, but like it, a, a pretense so thin it might as well not be there. Well, yeah, that's uh, what I was thinking. I'd heard some analysis or read some analysis highlighting that, you know, this is China just deliberately saying, without actually just saying the words, it's making the strongest implication they can that they are fine with hostage diplomacy. And if you want to fuck with them, they will fuck with you without hesitation. And in that way, it's not really them losing because they have made their message, which I think we all disagree with, I hope. It's pretty safe to say, but it comes across fairly clearly. And in that case, it's A-plus communications. And it's worth pointing out, the two Michaels are not the only four nationals being held in China under somewhat dubious circumstances. I think the Australians have a couple of their citizens. On Canada land earlier today, they were mentioning there are a lot of Chinese Canadians being held in, or Canadians of Chinese descent being held in China, a uh, number of journalists, a number of individuals, just people with not the same, I don't want to say prominence. I don't think anyone knew who these Michaels, not anyone, but most people wouldn't have known these Michaels beforehand. They were. Right. I, I'm specifically, though, thinking of people whose detention has political impacts in their home country which uh, the Michaels definitely fall into that category. And I, I gather that a couple of Australians being held are in a slightly similar situation. So Meng signs her deferred prosecution agreement. Is she still facing a trial in the US then? Is that what I understand from that? Not if she doesn't commit any crimes on American soil in the next six months, which I would put somewhere at a 0% chance of happening. I don't know that she'll even leave China in the next six months. So, Ian, no trial unless something absolutely crazy happens. If she, uh, Okay, so if in seven months she goes to the U.S., she's just not in any uh, legal jeopardy at that point? Scott, she could even go back to the States today. And as long as she doesn't commit any crimes... There's really no issue that's that's going to come up. If she goes to the States in seven months and commits a crime, she might be on trial for something different then. But as far as this these fraud um, allegations go, they will the prosecution will end after six months. Technically, it's already ended. There's no prosecution that's happening right now, but it will be completely dropped within six months, is my understanding. Right. And I mean... I love. I just keep coming back to this PowerPoint presentation, and it makes me really think about all the exaggerations I've made while doing PowerPoint presentations, and maybe I need to be a little bit um, more careful with my words, let's say. 
even when I'm I think if your time. words might cause a bank to violate sanctions, then yes, Ian, you might want to be a bit more cautious with your words. <laughs> I'm good. Not legal advice. You're not giving legal advice here. An analysis. That's why I said might. So I guess that wraps up the Meng saga, as far as I can tell. China, like we said, says that the two Michaels both signed confessions and then agreed to plea deals and got out on bail because of medical reasons and are now back in Canada, which was all very conveniently like within an hour of Meng's agreement being announced. And I also oh, yeah, forgot I think they because this... Time they practically timed the flights to take off at the same time. Yeah, or maybe it was 10 minutes apart. I also like that this all happened two days after the election. Really. Yeah, that timing doesn't seem coincidental. And I'm not sure if Merritt Garland's paying that much attention to the Canadian election, but there's got to be at least some concern in, ar around that, doesn't there? It. I, I, I was trying to figure out if it would have been better for Trudeau for this to have happened a week before the election. And I I can't tell. It's such a like fizzle of an end to the story. And the Michaels are being heralded as heroes across Canada. They're getting massive favorable media attention, which I guess might have rubbed off on Trudeau since he got to, you know, greet them at the Calgary airport. But maybe yeah, it also like raises it... the question of what was all of this about? Yeah. Like, yeah, he, he literally, I think he, yeah, had a couple of good days after that, but I don't know, like a week later, it does not feel like this has been a lingering cess that's generated a lot of warm, fuzzy feelings for Trudeau, d despite the fact that there's, I think, pretty universal relief that the two Michaels are back. I'm very curious about the effect that this this experience will have on relationships between Canada and China. I think it's got to have some kind of cooling effect between the two countries. You might recall that there was a free trade agreement that was being negotiated between the two countries before this episode unfolded. I'll be curious to see what happens. I'll tell you one thing, Scott. I, I thought that O'Toole's positioning during the election, specifically with respect to China, would have played better. And it just doesn't seem like foreign policy had that much of an effect in this last election. Although, no. frankly, given the outcome, I don't know if anything had an effect on this the, election. The reasons politicians don't talk about it and journalists rarely ask about it is because it turns out people, most Canadians don't actually care. There are like a dozen of us who yeah. care enough to th factor that in when we vote. But yeah, I, I did think it would maybe have a little bit more salience this time just because the Michaels were still under captivity. They passed the thousand day mark during the election and... China does not have a good reputation in Canada at the moment. I think the last polling I saw, which admittedly I think was a couple months old, they were under 20% in, in terms of favorable opinions by Canadians of them. Like You, you think it would be one of those things where if a politician can find an 80-20 issue and, and firmly plant themselves on the 80% side, that there'd be some upside to it. Well, but just being angry at the second one of the largest economies in the world might play well or could potentially play well politically but it's a bigger question of is it a smart strategy most can like it's also not a deep concern issue yeah maybe 80 percent of canadians aren't that fond of china but it's not moving votes and so people will go you know what i probably do agree with o'toole more that we should have been tougher but now they can look at this and say at least trudeau got results and trudeau's stupid line in the debate about not throwing tomatoes across the pacific maybe turned out to be accurate although it seems more like the americans did the hard work on the diplomatic front over us we didn't really have any chips to play on that debate we don't know that at That's the true. end of the day it could have been canadians working with the justice department saying look if we really want the the Michaels back, and would you be willing to resume talks with Meng's legal counsel in the States or with Huawei's legal counsel to ensure the return of the Michaels? I think those are things that might come out in books over the next five to ten years, but you're right, Ian. We just won't know that for a little while. That's a good point. Yeah.
but yeah, go, going forward, I think it's definitely going to result in, in a cooler relationship. I'm a little curious how much the Trudeau government was holding back because they didn't want to make the, the Michael situation ver- worse versus just <sighs> generally not wanting to rock the boat too much on the relationship with China regardless. It's hard to say. Does, like, the, the Liberal Party's always had a fondness for China that's been pretty persistent, at least as long as I've been play, paying attention to politics. So it's a bit of, I think, of an open question how much those factors played into it. And we'll have to see, does Canada join the rest of the Five Eyes and uh, officially ban in Huawei? It's going to be interesting to see. I can definitely see us taking a far less adversarial approach, more of just a sit back, be quiet about it. Just because there's so much money involved and money speaks to power and business interests will be to cool things down, will be like, it's one of the funny things about capitalism where I'm generally fairly critical of it writ large, but global capital is actually really effective at dissuading wars. What's that whole point about countries with McDonald's don't go to war with one another or haven't ever gone to war with one another? Well, that was true up until 2014 when the McDonald's having countries of Russia and Ukraine got into a, a scrap that still has not been resolved. Fair enough. Uh, also, France was Germany's largest trade partner in the lead up to the World Wars. Things are shifting, though. I'm hopeful that we can be <laughs> looking at a more peaceful future. Yeah, and I, I think your always- your larger point that global trade has suppressed wars in general is apt and accurate. Thank you. So, point being, I can see why the liberals would want to steer back to a quieter relationship where this isn't a big focus. It's not a strong front for Trudeau. He's not, he likes dancing around on international stages, talking about Canada being back. But I think, yeah, and that Glean has, he doesn't dance as much as uh, Jagmeet Singh after election night, though. I'll give him that. I think Trudeau, he's had a tougher time on the international stage for the last year. And I don't know why he's still prime minister, to be honest. What does he actually enjoy about the job? I guess photo ops? <laughs> this is a deeper question that I think we'll have to come back to. Maybe we should shift gears into the other big legal news for the week, unless there's anything else either of you want to talk about on the Mengs and the Michaels. All right, let's jump into the other legal news of the week. Fairy Creek injunction is over. Was This, was, this felt like a surprise ruling. It came out of nowhere. I'm sure many of the protesters were watching this closely, but the BC Supreme Court this week just decided to not extend the injunctions around the Ferry Creek logging activities on Vancouver Island, meaning most of the cops have just gone home. So, Micah, maybe take us back to the granting of this injunction, of this initial injunction, And give us the brief overview from your perspective of what was going on and why the courts decided to first grant an injunction here. Sure. Let me just very quickly describe what an injunction is. In the most simple possible terms, an injunction prevents people from doing something, some action. And in this case, the injunction was specifically suppressing the ability of individuals to prevent the logging of old growth trees in an area described as TFL 46, which is on on Vancouver Island. Most of your listeners, Ian and Scott, will be familiar with what's going on, but um, I hope it's okay to patronize them just for a moment that old growth logging in British Columbia is highly contentious. There are a number of protesters who pour the idea of old growth logging in BC and have taken whatever steps they can to prevent that type of logging from continuing. What's happened since the initial injunction was granted in April 2021 is this gradual ramping up of the protesters trying to suppress logging activity and the RCMP to 
suppress the protest of the logging activities, if that makes sense. As time has gone on, the RCMP have gotten more aggressive, I'd say, in enforcing the court-ordered injunction, while the protesters have taken more extreme measures. They've erected what are described as tripods on logging roads to prevent logging trucks from accessing the roads. They've, I guess, created anchors. So they block certain areas of TFL 46 and have these submerged anchors or weights that make it very difficult to remove them. They tie themselves up to trees. And as as matters have progressed, like I said, the RCMP have done a couple of things that have made life very difficult on the protesters. Not only have their physical interactions gone up in terms of severity, but also they've done some other interesting things that came to the forefront during this injunction decision. Specifically, what they were doing was first, when journalists would come into the area, they would have to be chaperoned by the RCMP and only taken to very specific locations within TFL 46 that they were allowed to uh, report from. The second thing that came up was these patches that they would, the RCMP would wear while they were enforcing this injunction order that said thin blue line. Now, I, I can't get into the, all the specifics about uh, thin blue line because, frankly, I'm not that educated. But from the most recent decision that I've read, the RCMP wear this patch, they say, because they want to honor their fallen colleagues, people who have been injured and killed while serving the RCMP, the protesters, and frankly, a, a number of Indigenous and other members uh, of color, people of color, see this as a, a colonial patch, something that the RCMP wear to acknowledge the fact that they're a colonial force, that they're able to commit acts of violence with near impunity. And so, it's a very controversial symbol. The brass at the RCMP, the people at the very top, do not want the RCMP to be wearing these patches. I think the RCMP's union takes a different view and want those patches to continue. And for the RCMP uh, members that were enforcing this injunction order in TFL 46 at Ferry Creek, there was no one who was ordering the RCMP officers to take the patch off. And then this third issue that was coming up that was reported on was that the RCMP officers started making their identification badges, even their badge numbers, ineligible. Uh, illegible. So, they would blank it out or they would put tape over it. So, it became impossible to um, identify these individuals and that came with a whole host of other issues. So, all of these things that are happening on, on the RCMP's side in terms of their behavior come to a head because the April 2021 injunction order, Ian, that you were mentioning, expired. It, it was set to expire on September 26th. So, the company with the logging rights in this area, Teal Cedar, applied for a renewal. And that takes us to this application that, that just came out on September 28th. And so, before we get into that, I want to just re-emphasize some of the things you highlighted there. Like, this protest has become as far as I can tell, and it's been reported as the largest protest in Canadian history. There have been 1,100 arrests. This is not, you know, a fringe, small thing. There are a lot of people going there. And it's fascinating to actually watch from the outside because this is an unorganized cell, essentially. Like, it's under this rainforest or this rainforest flying squad. But that's not an incorporated organization. Like, this injunction is actually against unknown persons operating as Rainforest Flying Squad, Robert Arby's one specific person, and as well as John Doe, Jane Doe, and persons unknown. It's just against a bunch of strangers, which I guess you also have to do in an injunction like this when you are trying to keep the unknown hordes, as it were, from coming in. So you have that on the one side. And then on the police side, as you're mentioning, there hasn't been, there's been coverage of this but the coverage kind of waxes and wanes. And what is that journalists are incredibly frustrated and fewer mainstream journalists go out there. And so the majority of the journalists who are going out there are from small independent media outlets, new ones, leftist media. And I think they're ones the cops feel they can push around. Like they don't have the same legal teams behind them that someone from the Globe and Mail or CBC would probably have. And so the cops feel a bit emboldened and they're pushing journalists in a way that 
The cops have been told repeatedly by the courts, you can't do that. They have charter rights to report on things. And then on the protester side, there's been a few videos that have come out from protesters or others with, you know, people being pepper sprayed and things that look aggressive and like beyond the normal use of force that would be reasonable. And all of this kind of comes to the head before the court here. There's one other element that I want to throw into the pot that we were talking about briefly just before we started recording, and that's the First Nation interest in this case. The the area of TFL 46, according to the court's findings, it overlaps with the traditional territories of the Pachadat and the Diditat First Nations. And what has been reported pretty widely is that members of those First Nations do not want the protesters there. Whatever, and by, by the way, the elected leadership and what is recognized as the hereditary leadership do not want the protesters there. That doesn't mean the entire First Nation has reached a consensus. There are individuals, uh, leaders within those First Nations that want the protests to continue, want to protect old growth logging. But it certainly complicates the issue by ten, uh, tenfold when you have First Nations leadership that have requested a number of times for the protesters to leave, and those requests have gone largely ignored. That includes the request just yesterday following the release of this court decision from the Pachidat elders again, the sixth time that they have asked, this is Chief uh, Jeff Jones saying, we respectfully re reiterate our request that all protesters vacate our territory to allow us to conduct this work in peace. Pretty clear. It's so complex. This is, there are so many different uh, sides to this issue, and they all come to a head. They all come before Mr. Justice Thompson through this request by Teal Cedar to extend the injunction for a further 12 months. The first injunction was for a length and time of six months, and uh, Teal Cedar wanted it to last for another year. And we come, Ian, to, to what you were saying, a, a fairly surprising result where the injunction was not extended. So why wasn't it extended? What was the specific reasons uh, given? If I could summarize it in one way, Scott, I'd say that the court did not want to associate itself with the actions of the RCMP. It took, on balance, um, whether or not it would be convenient to extend the, the injunction. There's three elements to an application for an injunction. The first is whether there's a serious issue to be tried, and the second is whether there's irreparable harm. And for those two issues... Mr. Jumps, Justice Thompson found they were met. It, it didn't even take him a long time to come to that conclusion. But when it came to the balance of convenience, he looked at what the RCMP was doing and how it was being reflected on the court. Because every time the RCMP would make these arrests, they'd send out this press release that said, RCMP takes action enforcing court order. And the way Mr. Justice Thompson reasoned through it, the courts were being forced to the front lines of this altercation between the protesters and the RCMP. And every action taken by the RCMP in, in limiting the ability of uh, the media to survey the entire TFL area by smashing protesters' guitars, by pepper spraying them, by covering their badges, it was a poor reflection on the courts because it was the courts that were asked to have this injunction order. So I think that this is – it isn't exactly fair to the entirety of Mr. Justice Thompson's reasons. But if I could just summarize it in one way, I would say it – the actions taken by the RCMP could not be tolerated by the courts. And, and they felt that if they were going to extend the injunction, it would be – at the expense of the public interest, and it would be seen to condone the actions taken by the RCMP. And, and that just wasn't an option that Justice Thompson was comfortable with. This feels incredible to me. Like This feels relatively unprecedented in Canadian law for the court to say, it's the cop's fault, effectively. <laughs> like The cops are going too far. We just need to shut it all down. Like The courts have obviously reprimanded the 
cops on many ta- occasions, individually or groups of, for civil liberties violations or charter violations. But I don't know. Maybe I'm just not haven't read enough of these kind of cases to know a case where the court basically says the RCMP's actions writ large are bringing the justice system into disrepute. Ian, I, I, this is my fear in trying to summarize it in one way. I think it's the public interest issue that was really what was important to, to the court in this case. And I should say that it wasn't as if Justice Thompson said, free reign to the protesters. You can now do whatever you want. Nothing's going to be enforced. It's still a criminal code contravention to get in the way of these commercial activities. The problem for Teal Cedar is that it's unlikely that if these protesters are arrested pursuant to the criminal code that there will actually be any kind of prosecution. Some of the affidavits that were filed had evidence contained within it that said that if the protesters were arrested pursuant to the criminal code, the BC Prosecution Service wasn't going to lift a finger. They weren't actually going to prosecute these people. The only way they would do that is if there was an injunction order so that the prosecution service could say, here is a court order that you've clearly violated. This is obvious contempt of court. So it's all on uh, David Eby's shoulder. Uh, (laughs) No, the (laughs) prosecution service is independent of the political angle as we just talked about, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think what the, the court would say something like, it's not up to us to decide who's going to be prosecuted. But here's the criminal code. The criminal code lays out clear penalties if you are inhibiting uh, the ability of industry to produce commerce in certain ways. So if you have a problem with these protesters, you have an avenue. You don't even need the injunction. But if they're not actually going to charge anyone, do you really have an avenue at that point? That's the isn't that the practical issue, and that's not for the courts to decide. That's that's the way Justice Thompson kind of gets out of this catch twenty two that Teal Cedar's in. That's the way that the court can say we're not letting anybody have free reign here. We still have a criminal code. But Scott, practically speaking, this is probably what Teal Cedar was pounding on the table trying to say: if we don't have this injunction, we have nothing. Practically speaking, we have nothing to prevent the protesters from. Um, interrupting with our legal ability to harvest timber. But it really does end up then, assuming, and you mentioned as we were just about to hit record that Teal Cedar has announced they intend to appeal this. So it ends up assuming the appeal doesn't work, assuming this is where we stand. I feel like it has to end up back in the political realm where the BCNDP have been eager to not deal with this. They just want to not get in the middle of the war in the woods 2.0. I don't see, I don't know about that, Ian, because John Horgan was saying today that he was very frustrated and wished that the protesters would listen to First Nations leadership. So I'm not sure how neutral the BCNDP actually is. I think it would be a lot easier if the protesters would. To kind of go away politically for the BC NDP, but yeah, it's a tricky one for them. No doubt, they're going to have to make some some decisions. For example, whether or not to try and prosecute these these protesters under the provisions of the criminal code. Yeah, and I think part of it problem for them is this does not seem to be an issue the BC NDP is unified on. I, I get the where John Hording's coming from on this, but. That is not the only viewpoint in there. There's a pretty strong contingent of NDPers out there who want to see the logging stop. And I mean, we saw during the election that Jagmeet Singh basically um, tried to wet, go out of his way to pretend he didn't know the BC NDP and what they were doing <laughs> uh, here on right. this. So this is something that's going to divide their caucus if they actually have to go ahead and start making decisions on this. And that can't be too comfortable for Horgan and the, the government. I think they're praying for a successful appeal. One thing, uh, by the way, I should add, just on the topic of First Nations leadership, and I think that this is important, when the when the extension application for the injunction came up, 
the First Nations that did not file any sort of application response, either in support or opposition to the extension of the injunction. I think that bears noting. As Ian says, First Nations leadership, Pachetat First Nations leadership, has come out and, and again asked the protesters to leave the territory. But they stopped short of formally supporting this injunction extension. I think it's knowing the result, it's fair enough to look at how the police were behaving and how the RCMP was behaving and just go, you know what, as the local First Nations leaders, I don't think we can put our, our, we can't approve of this, we can't condone it. And so I can see why they may still support the logging, but not support the way in which it's being ensured to happen. And I don't know that they have any easier outs at this point than the province. They want this to occur for economic reasons. And there have been some deals reached and with the province that we've reported on before, where much of the old growth is getting deferrals and there are getting protections That's around right. those. Which also makes me just wonder what the protesters are still fighting over, but i that's my own ignorance and I need to go do a bit more reading between now and the next time this comes up in the news. But man, it's amazing still to me what the RCMP was thinking they can get away with when they figure no one's watching. Like the thin blue line stuff, the covering up your badges, it's just like gross police overreach. And we're still in the midst and it's going to be ongoing of a police reform here in the BC, a police act reform. And I hope these incidents are weighing heavy on the minds of the MLAs considering that. And how do we make sure there is better oversight of these kinds of actions? Because this was like, you don't have to agree with the protesters, but they still have rights. Do you know who the uh, local MLA is for TFL 46? It's Horgan, it's Mr. Horgan it? himself. It is, it? it is John Horgan, that's correct. He'll have to navigate these issues in his own backyard, as it turns out. All right, we'll leave it there, Micah. Maybe you can just give listeners a heads up of where they can find your random musings and thoughts about politics and everything should they want to get in touch with you or follow you. You can follow me on Twitter at Micah Goldberg. And uh, I want to say thanks to you guys both for having me on once again. It's always a privilege, and I look forward to covering some other cases very soon. Switching gears to our final segment of the pod, the BC Liberal Leadership Debate happened this Tuesday, featuring the SITS official candidates at this point. There, there may be one more coming, but we can get to that uh, in a little bit. So Michael Lee, Ellis Ross, Val Litwin, Kevin Falcon, Renee Merrifield, and Gavin Dew all took to the stage. And we got a sense of who's going to be going into the next election as a potential uh, leader of the BC Liberal Party. You watched part of the debate. What did you think? I managed to watch the first half of it at my lunch break today and it was like i'll say this it was a better thing to watch than the federal leaders debate it's maybe because bar. yeah and maybe because it's a political party leadership debate so it's more marked by what nathan cullen once described as violent agreement rather than the like unnecessary at times necessary but the hostility of a federal leadership an election campaign where you have different ideologies on display I think it also probably benefited from not having like 40 random citizens and every journalist in the province coming in one after another to ask a question. Yeah, so let's talk about that. The format was much better. Number one, the moderation was just a single person, so they didn't have to go into that. Number two, as I mentioned, it wasn't as adversarial, so they weren't trying to yell over each other all of the time. Although... We'll get into it and how everyone tried to gang up on Kevin Falcon. Number three, just having... They had intros and outros, right? They had more time to answer things. It felt well, like nothing was as rushed. It wasn't like, you have five more seconds to answer this. It was, here, you have a minute. Tell us who you are and why you want to be leader of the BC Liberals. The federal debate had intros and outros. It just got shoehorned into the first 
and last question. But here they actually properly formatted the debate, because of course there's going to be intros to it. Why wouldn't you have it there? So naturally they did have it. Yeah, the the moderation just felt kind of more level and less aggressive. Like Overall, I thought the format was pretty good. They apparently each got a bunch of challenge cards that they could throw down at one point or any point to uh, direct a question to one of the other participants, which seemed to work fairly well right up until the end when th- I guess they realized they had the 10 minutes card. left and a bunch of the, and a bunch of their challenges unused. And what I was going to say, I don't think I remember seeing any of those in the part of the debate I watched. I think there was one early on by, I think it was Gavin, but do, but yeah, uh, the the last ten minutes is basically challenge after challenge, as they uh, all rush to use up their their challenge opportunities. But other than those specific formats, the the, uh, the debate was fine. Like it's a couple days later, I think it's hard to get a good sense of it or what it means for the leadership race. And probably the biggest takeaway from all of it is that everybody knows Kevin Falcon's the front runner. He drew most of the heat specifically over just how committed he is to the party versus doing this as a thing for Kevin Falcon. Yeah. His was- decision to leave politics in 2013 got a heavy focus and as well as whether or not he'd commit to run in the next election, which he did not commit to. Yeah, I think I saw three different people ask him that question in a row, notably when Michael Lee asked it. And I think he was the final to just say, will you commit to run for this party? Because you didn't in 2011 or 2013. And he and Michael Lee also pointed out, like, why are you staying on this board on your on your day time on your day job as working with this development company? And Weirdly, Falcon decided to say, why are you staying on as an MLA when you're running? so weird. Yeah, that's his day job, but that's also the job he will want to have as leader of the party, like the job you should want to have, Kevin Falcon. Why aren't you an MLA yet? And they asked him, where will you run if you're elected? And Like Falcon's main answer of why he didn't run after or in the past or why he stepped out of politics was having young children. And I think that's a fair defense but not committing to running if he doesn't win the leadership like he's basically saying i'm back for me and to make this party my party and if it's not going to be my party i don't want to play with it yeah and maybe you like him maybe you think he's got the best vision or the best ability to lead and you don't care if he doesn't win if he's not but he's running the kind of campaign where he's not going to be attracting a lot of second choices right now yeah, I think that's definitely fair, and you can tell he's pretty rusty on a lot of things. Like, everyone he, was bad. Not bad, but everyone felt forced, to be fair. Yeah, but like, for a front runner in particular, he felt rusty for right. someone who's an experienced cabinet minister. He had a couple of things that I, I think if this had been like a, a general election debate would have probably being the headline gaffes of the night that weird exchange with michael lee and at one point he said something about the well defending the decision to leave politics to attend to his fa- family he said going back basically said going back into politics would be abandoning his family which is like obviously not what he meant but Man, was that a bad thing to say. Especially when pretty much everyone on that stage has kids, as far as I could tell. Yeah, like I think, yeah, Val Litwin talked about his young kids. I I know Gavin Do has young kids. And yeah, I think pretty much everybody on that stage has kids at one age or another. I'll give Falcon credit for talking to his experience. There was a question on building transit infrastructure in the lower mainland, and he could point to his past at being the guy who made the Canada line happen. And the BC Liberals did that, whether you agree with how it's done or what it costs and all of that, that is part of their legacy. And he can talk to having been at the table when those decisions were made. Yeah, that was one part of the debate I I quite liked when they actually kind of got into the specifics of lower mainland transit, which was 
good to see and it's oddly refreshing when a debate political debate actually gets into those details rather than being just a series of prepared statements and i think your other favorite question was probably will you step on all the municipalities to get housing built yeah so this is actually i think the most interesting part to come out of the debate was oddly enough kind of like the federal debate the, the most interesting part was actually just what question ended up getting asked and like this is a question that nobody would have asked in a debate five, ten years ago. But the moderator basically asked, we all know that there's a big housing shortage and municipalities have a large share of the responsibility for that. Will you commit to basically step, I can't recall the exact words, but basically will you step in and get things sorted out and use provincial powers on that? And just, I think, goes to show how much the kind of discourse and debate around housing has changed. That is, A, even a question, and then B, that basically everybody agreed with the premise of the question, and not everyone agreed to run roughshod over the municipalities, but nobody was entirely, like, vocally opposed to the idea either. I'm just waiting for, like, someone at UBCM to come out with everyone the the moderator should apologize for this uh, <laughs> everyone should be offended by the fact this was even asked no that's not going to happen you're right it was super interesting to see it asked i didn't think anyone had a strong answer on it because they all tiptoed around it i think val litwin was maybe actually the most direct in saying he would want to use provincial powers but he would also i think he f they all framed it around negotiations as their like main go-to like we'll just we just need to be able to better but i was it him who talked about funding tying funding to density and things like that yeah he i believe he was the one who's who talked about that so there were some like concrete things there that were interesting now i'll say that about val litwin but he was also all over the place like he started off by talking about how the bc liberal party is an outdated operating system that needs a reboot and an upgrade to the Definitely next version the, the most was, forced metaphor the night award goes to and him. it went so long it was like 45 seconds of his minute intro i was like this is you're beating the dead horse here we get it you work in tech i don't even know if he does he ran the chamber of commerce i think which obviously right. has some tech companies in it but yeah he he's definitely like the most enthusiastic person on the stage at least this public presentation but the unfortunate part is that also gives him the I want you to invest in my new startup energy to him, which isn't maybe the best one for a potential premier. Do you think it came off better than the Netflix blockbuster joke by Gavin Du? It wasn't really a joke, but yeah, that that was also pretty awkward. I'm not sure which one was came off worse or better. I think Val had a I think probably more polished delivery so i guess modest points to him there he felt he just felt less awkward on the stage yeah i want to come back to the housing question because i'm just remembering Dew's answer was to fully dodge the policy and talk about the spirit the spirit of it or the spirituality in the angle and it was really weird because i thought he could have brought forward something more to that and instead he tried to go for the heart when i think the average BC Liberal voter is probably more of a head voter. Yeah, I, I find found annoying. Like I've had one on one conversations with him. Where we've talked housing policy. Like I, I know he has thoughts on it, so it's kind of a, a little annoying not to see that uh, as much in the answer. But I, I will say there is something to the idea that I think in order to be effective in a campaign, you do generally need to come across as not just having the right policy answers but also act caring about the people who are are voting for you and buried in that slightly awkward from the heart met answer on there that there is something to consider on that and that is i think where the liberals had fallen down in 2017 and then 2020 on their campaigns. So three others on the stage, Renee Merrifield, Ellis Ross, Michael Lee, 
I'll touch on Maryfield first. I thought her performances felt the most forced. Like I only saw the first half, but some of the points when she was standing there or, or making her she felt unpolished and like awkward it was uncomfortable watching her i thought maybe that was just me and my own biases but i was not impressed yeah i don't really have a strong take away from her uh performance very forgettable. both her and michael lee faded into the background for me i i don't think they left a strong impression one way or the other yeah and i think ross did better than i was expecting he was able to speak to he took the north back from the NDP and he convinced his own nation to go in on LNG and he's made that happen and he was able to speak to a lot of things that paint him as a leader and because he has been a leader in his community and he was stood out for that and then you get this interesting exchanges so we mentioned that they could ask one another a question and many of them asked antagonistic questions towards Kevin Falcon but then there was this realm of softball questions from one to another like I forget who, but someone asked Ellis Ross, why are you so awesome? And then someone asked Renee Merrifield, like, how we need a more diverse party. How do we get more women? You're the woman. And I'm just like, what is ha what is obviously happening is they're trying to line up like your supporters should be my supporters and we should be more friendly in this competition. So whoever our, our second choices go to the others and one of us can beat Kevin. Or they're taking the, the non-disparagement clauses in the leadership election rules very seriously. <laughs> They weren't as serious about it with Kevin Falcon, though. Like, yeah, th nothing there, though, I think, fell into the disparagement. But th there were definitely pointed questions at Falcon, which were not echoed when they asked other candidates for things. So overall takeaways from the debate, was there a winner? Who's the leader of the pack? Let's say that way. Coming uh, out of this. Falcon went in as the front runner and... He did not emerge unscathed, but neither did he torpedo his chances. So I guess he gets a technical win on that. Is so, there a uh, most improved player award? Who? Because we have Kevin Falcon, and then we have three MLAs, and then we have two non-MLAs. So we have three tiers of candidates there. Who advanced their fortunes the most, do you think? Maybe Val Litwin? Yeah, like of the non-MLAs. Yeah, no one knew who he was, and now he's the operating system guy. Yeah, he came across as polished, a little too polished at times, but he generally presented himself well, was able to held his own in the policy debate sections. So yeah, just in terms of boosting profile-wise, I think he probably was the most successful. Like I said, Michael Lee and Renee Merrifield were just there. I can't remember a significant interaction from really either of them on that which i guess means they didn't improve their chances no one fell like on you, their face fully to be to their yeah. credit but like you said ellis ross did fine i think gavin do generally did fine both need to polish up their general i think demeanor and question not really demeanor but general presentations need to i think be polished up both felt awkward answering some of the questions not like they didn't know what they were talking about, but there was not the smoothness that an experienced politician really has with both of them. Yeah, I don't know. I, I was hoping to find someone or spot someone here who I could like clearly see presenting a formidable challenge in the next election, and I didn't really find it. Yeah, um, and it's interesting because the idea is who have these six people would present a good debate challenger to John Horgan because this is a debate and you have to, there will be at least one debate they'll have to do with him and Sonia first to now. And I don't think John Horgan is actually a great debater. Like he's not super strong in that field. He can come off as very personable and he's getting better at it. But like the two elections he's run, he's had to walk back stuff in his, both of those elections for stuff that happened in the debate, I think. Yeah, he came off too angry the first time and then had the weird flub around racial issues and not being colorblind in the second one. Which, to be fair, Wilkinson did almost as bad or worse, depending on your perspective. But among this group, they'll just, like, maybe they'll, they'll get better because this is a long leadership race. And then they, I guess to John Horgan's credit, he, he gave them a few years to warm up and get better at politics before they have to go to a general election at least 
yeah, the vote's not till February, so we'll see how things develop on that front. This, this debate did confirm my concerns with Falkid, and honestly, I think he's going to potentially be a pretty big liability, both with just the baggage of being a minister for a long time on that kind of terms with it, and like the, the consensus that emerged in like the 90s and whatnot, and what the BC Liberal Party was, and their coalition, and kind of their values proposition, like it's it needs a refresh for sure, and perhaps a more in-depth rethink of what that coalition and proposition, values proposition is, and I just got no sense of that from Kevin Falcon at all. Very much as the return to the early 2000s BC Liberal Party that I don't think has the same cash day it did back in, well, the early 2000s. If the party is looking for an entirely different route to go on October 9th, Aaron Gunn has announced he is making a special announcement after hearing from his friends and supporters, and he'll be doing that. Presumably, he's going to announce he's running for the BC Liberal leadership. He had previously announced he's forming an exploratory committee, and now he has a picture of himself in front of a big BC flag saying, on the future of the BC, on the future of BC and the BC Liberal leadership race. So, you could join him in Victoria, BC if you want. Yay. And that has been Playcoast. Find links to everything we talked about at playcoast.ca. Support the show and get access to our Slack channel at patreon.com slash playcoast. Our intro music credit is Beautiful British Columbia by Sir Plotnikoff. Playcoast is a production of Legend Boot Media and editing services are provided by CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. Wash your hands and stay home. Thanks for listening.